Muhammad called them raisin heads, but I'm proud to call them brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm of course referring to the people of Ethiopia. Today, I'll tell the story of one of them, Zacharias, a former Muslim sheikh who led around 10,000 Muslims to Christ. Along the way, I'll also take a look at the phenomenon of Muslim dreams and visions leading them to Christianity. This video is part of a series on Muslim movements to Christ, that is, mass conversions of a thousand or more Muslims from a single ethno-linguistic group within two decades. Each video stands on its own, but a playlist can be found in the pinned comment in case you missed any of the previous episodes. In the last installment, I told the story of Sadra, an Indonesian ex-Muslim who led 10-20,000 to 20, Muslims to Christ at the end of the 19th century. Around the same time, another movement was starting on the other side of the Indian Ocean. Its leader was a former sheikh named Zacharias. Zacharias was born around the year 1845 in the Bagendar province of the Ethiopian Empire. Christianity has a long history in Ethiopia, dating all the way back to the Book of Acts when Philip's testimony brought the gospel to an Ethiopian eunuch. Multiple early sources state the Apostle Matthew went to Ethiopia, although there is some ambiguity as to whether this is the same as modern Ethiopia or an area in Asia that had the same name. Regardless of who first brought the gospel to the region, it spread quickly and by the 3rd century it had a strong foothold in Ethiopia. It was a slave named Frumentius who played the most important role, however. As a boy, Frumentius was taken into slavery after the ship he was on wrecked. He ended up being given to the king of Axum. Much like the biblical figures of Joseph and Daniel, Frumentius found favor with the pagan king and gained his trust. When the king died, Frumentius was freed, but stayed in Ethiopia to tutor the new king, Izana, who was still a minor. When Izana came of age, Frumentius returned to his homeland and became a priest. He was eventually appointed as the first bishop of Ethiopia after advocating for more missionary efforts in the region. After returning to Axum, Frumentius converted King Izana to Christianity. Within a decade, the majority of the kingdom was Christian. In 330 AD, Izana made Christianity the official state religion, making his nation just the second Christian country, the first being Armenia. Islam, likewise, has a long history in Ethiopia. According to Islamic history, early Meccan followers of Muhammad fled to Ethiopia to avoid persecution, where they were welcomed by the Christian emperor. While the story is probably legendary, reliable history shows Muslim traders brought their religion to Ethiopia within the first 200 years of Islam. Unlike the more coastal Somalia to the east, however, Islam never became dominant. At the time of Zacharias' birth, the Ethiopian Empire was around 25% Muslim, 40% Christian, and 35% tribal religions. He grew up in a rural Muslim community where he attended Quran school and became a Muslim teacher. In his 40s, he began to experience visions. In the first, a man from God came to give him greater insight into the Quran. A second vision featured three sheikhs who encouraged him to be bold in interpreting the Quran. Zacharias was told to preach against anything in Islam that was in conflict between the Torah, Gospels, and Quran. Two of the messengers then ascended to heaven, leaving the third to comfort and encourage him. Despite the obvious Trinitarian imagery of this second vision, Zacharias did not immediately become a Christian, but instead set out to reform Islam. Stay tuned for more on dreams and visions after the conclusion of his story. Zacharias sought out an Arabic Bible and began comparing the scriptures. His preaching soon brought him into conflict with local Muslims, and he was brought before authorities on several occasions on charges of heretical teaching and disturbing the peace. Each time, he argued his case from the Quran and was cleared of all wrongdoing. Surviving accounts of these court cases make it clear that he was slowly moving more towards Christian theology as he continued to investigate. Truth is compelling, and when one honestly compares the Quran and Bible, 
it is not hard to see the obvious superiority of the Christian message. Zacharias also experienced frequent death threats, but was not deterred. It is not clear exactly when he began to preach conversion to Christianity, but by 1906, when he was summoned to appear before the emperor, his message was clearly Christian. By this time, Zacharias had attracted a large following and won over at least 75 Muslim nobles, sheikhs, and community leaders. As a result, at least five different Muslim communities stood as accusers before the royal court. Zacharias insisted that only the Quran could be used to determine what Islam should teach, and successfully argued his message was compatible with the Old Testament, New Testament, and the Quran. A decree went forth. Shay Zacharias has answered from the Quran every accusation against him by the Muslims. Hence we have given him permission to teach in any Muslim area as he pleases. Now then, from this day forward, let no man bring an accusation concerning religious matters against Shay Zacharias, his followers, or those who are helped by his teaching. Shay Zacharias has utterly rebuted every accusation. In addition to the decree, Zacharias won the emperor's favor and was awarded a cash stipend and a fife for ongoing income. The monetary blessing, however, had its cost, as Zacharias would remark that the devil used to be far from him, but now he could see him standing nearby when he prayed. In 1910, Zacharias was baptized into the Ethiopian church along with 3,000 followers and took the name Nuwaya Christos, meaning Christ's possession. The movement continued to grow, and a 1915 figure put it as high as 10,000 people. A missionary report of the time remarked, Crowds of Muslims were baptized by Abyssinian priests en masse. Like Sadra's movement, that of Nuwaya Christos was viewed suspiciously by the established church, and his followers were prerogatively branded Addis Christian, or New Christians. Nuwaya Christos interpreted the Bible independently, and its movement acted independently, but retained a relationship with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. When he died in August or September 1920, some sought to make a more radical break with the Orthodox Church. The movement remained largely intact under the leadership of a man named Yusuf, but petered out when he also died in 1930. Most members eventually joined the Orthodox Church, with a few becoming Seventh-day Adventists. All remained Christians, however. Nuwaya Christos' teaching focused first and foremost on proper interpretation of the Bible. His work titled The Fixed and Permanent Collection shows a heavy emphasis on Old Testament prophecy and how it predicted Jesus, not Muhammad. He used the Gospels to prove Jesus' divinity and argued that various passages in the Quran were actually referring to Jesus rather than Muhammad. Interestingly, academics are beginning to see the same thing, arguing that the Quran was originally a Christian or pseudo-Christian text to which Muhammad's name was added at a later date. Noting the primacy of the Gospel, Nuwaya Christos remarked, What can be said after truth? except air. Where the Quran contradicts Christian teaching, he correctly called it devilish corruption and remarked, In the Quran the revelation of Satan has been included. As previously noted, a series of visions played a role in Zacharias's conversion. Dreams and visions are perhaps the best known of the factors causing unprecedented Muslim movements to Christ. A figure of around 50% of conversions being prompted by dreams is often put out there. But other Christians doubt the authenticity of such claims, pointing to the closed canon as evidence against further direct revelation by God. Where does the truth lie? A peer-reviewed paper by Sam Martin provides some answers. Martin surveyed more than 120 Muslim background believers and found that just over a third said a dream played a role in their conversion, significantly less than the oft-reported figure. More significantly, nearly all dreams occurred only after contact with a Christian or after reading the Bible. Few dreams had gospel-specific content, that is, content about the salvific mission of Jesus. 
Some dreams encouraged the dreamer to seek out a specific person for further information, while others confirmed information they had already heard. In contrast, over 90% of converts say the Bible played an important role in their conversion. More on that in a later video. Muslims are experiencing dreams and visions, but Christian evangelists in Bible reading are still driving conversion. Another common objection is to ask why only Muslims have these dreams, and why they've only occurred recently. In both cases, the assumption behind these questions turns out to be false. There have been numerous reports of Buddhists, Hindus, adherents to tribal religions, and so on, coming to Christ after dreams. So it's not actually just Muslims. But why does it seem to be most common among Muslims? Islam itself offers the answer as numerous traditions assign a strong value to dreams. If a person is expecting, or at least open, to revelation by dream, it makes sense that God would work with their existing expectations to bring the person to truth. Likewise, reports of Muslims coming to faith after a dream date back centuries. One common feature of contemporary accounts across multiple geographic regions is descriptions of a man in white that the dreamer intuitively knows to be Jesus. A paper by Bill Musk notes that missionary journals from the 1800s feature similar accounts, serving as a strong validation since it is very unlikely that modern dreams could be influenced by long-forgotten, 150-year-old journal entries. Finally, some say the idea of dreams leading people to Christ is unbiblical, that God simply doesn't work that way. However, the book of Acts demonstrates otherwise. Chapter 10 contains the story of Cornelius, a God-fearing Gentile. He has a vision that leads him to Peter. Peter in turn leads Cornelius and his household to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Just as it was in the early days of the church, it is today. God leads those that seek him into situations where they will hear the gospel. Just as God gave Cornelius a vision, he gave Zacharias a vision, and he is giving visions and dreams to Muslims today. Just as the gospel itself was shared through Peter, and Zacharias came to the true faith only after contact with missionaries who gave him an Arabic Bible, Muslims today come to Christ only after contact with Christians to whom they were led. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. No doubt he is raising up the next Zacharias somewhere right now. The next episode in this series will examine how Islamic violence is leading people to Christ by looking at the Indonesian revival of the 1960s when an estimated 2 million came to the faith. Make sure your notifications are on so you don't miss it. Thanks for watching.